Hey guys, welcome back to Theojo Tech. Do you guys like color? I hope so, because in this video, I'm gonna go really in depth into color spaces, color gamuts for computer monitors, color models, everything you can ever hope for to understand how color on the computer and in everyday life works so you can better understand it when you go to make your next monitor purchase. Even if you're not buying a monitor, hopefully you'll find this all really neat because I know I did. So why don't we start off with the term color space. This is probably something you've heard of before. Now, what exactly is a space? So in mathematics, a space is simply a set of something. So in this context, a color space is a set of colors. So in a color space, you're basically mapping a physical color like lights or pigment to the visual perception of a color in the human eye. Now, very often what we use as the standard for human color perception is the CIE 1931 color space. And what this aimed to do was map different wavelengths of light to the visual perceptions, how we perceive those specific wavelengths in the human eye. Now in the human eye, there are three different types of cones which perceive light. Each one is able to perceive different wavelengths. The one for short wavelengths perceives mostly blue. The one for middle wavelengths perceives mostly green and the longer one is red. And because there's three cones, that means that any color you ever want to produce can be created with three parameters. I'll get into what that actually means. Now, when dealing with color, the three parameters are called tri-stimulus values. So when you're looking at the human eye and perception, they could be L, M, and S for long, middle, and short but there are other ones depending on what system you're using. So different combinations of the different parameters will create different colors. And I wanna point out that the parameters, they're not real colors. They're just ways of representing them mathematically. Now, interestingly, the way the cones work, you're always gonna have two cones activated simultaneously because they overlap over the different ranges. Therefore, there are some tri-stimulus values that produce impossible colors, such as if you were to say, well, this color is 100% long wavelengths, but 0% the others because the red wavelengths, the long ones, overlap a lot with the green ones. So you can't just have the long wavelengths without doing the green. So that produces a problem. To have some colors, they would have to be negative color values, which doesn't work, obviously. So to fix this, they basically used one of the parameters as brightness as opposed to a color. So this brightness parameter kind of became an imaginary primary color of the three. And they also created some color matching formulas for these impossible colors. Now, in this 1931 color space, the three parameters are called X, Y, and Z. And these can cover every single color experience that the average person can perceive. Now, humans actually perceive green parts of the light spectrum as brighter, so they used the M middle cones as brightness. So for these three parameters, Y is luminance, Z is blue colors, and X is a mixture of the other non-negative colors. All right, so that was a lot of technical mumbo jumbo. Now for the next part, if you didn't understand all that, just know that to produce a color, you need three parameters, and that's all you really have to understand. Now there are several options for choosing what you wanna use as these three parameters. Usually how it works is you pick three different primary colors, one for each parameter, but that's not always the case. I'll get into some other examples. Now the different systems for representing these three parameters are called color models. You've probably heard of a few of them. The first one is RGB. You've probably heard of this. Red, green, and blue are the primary colors, and this is considered an additive color model because to create a color, you add different amounts of each primary color to produce the one you want. Now, the next common one is CMYK. This is usually used in printing. Now, the primary colors for this one are cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, or black. This one is actually called a subtractive model because it's all about what is reflected or not absorbed by the medium as opposed to adding things together. Now the reason black is used as a fourth color in this one is because you can use black to desaturate and darken colors without having to combine more of the other primary colors. 
So you could produce any color with cyan, magenta, and yellow, but it's cheaper to just add black ink and darken things as opposed to using more of the primary colors. So it's really just a way to save money by adding that fourth primary color, black. Another model you may have heard of is YPBPR, which is basically a way of encoding an RGB signal. Now the three different parameters in this one are Y for luminance, PB for the difference between the blue and luminance channel, and the PR, which is the difference between the red and the luma channel. Green colors are actually derived from the other channels, so you don't actually need to send the green information separately. And the final common model you've probably heard of is the HSL, or sometimes HSV, which stands for hue, saturation, and lightness, or sometimes value. And this is basically just a transformation of the RGB model. Now this is a cylindrical coordinate system where the hue is the angle around a cylinder and that's just the fully saturated color. And then saturation and lightness are pretty self-explanatory. These are often used in image editors and color pickers. You've probably seen this because it's really intuitive and easy to understand how to get to different colors with it. Now that we know the color models, there are different color spaces that are within each color model. Now we already talked about the CIE 1931 color space, which encompasses the set of colors in all of human vision, but there are smaller color spaces within each model that you've probably heard of. We're gonna stick to the RGB model, but just know that there are others. For each RGB color space, it's gonna be basically represented by a triangle when mapped onto the CIE 1931 color space, and that's just because there's three parameters, red, green, blue, so each one is a vertex on a triangle. You can kind of think of the different vertexes as coordinates for the definition of the color space. And in a bit, I'll get into some specific examples so you can understand what I'm talking about. Now, each RGB color space also has a white point, which basically defines what white should be compared to the other colors. Now, our eyes actually kind of have an auto white balance. Our eye assigns the white point to whatever is the brightest thing we're looking at currently. But in RGB color space, it has to be defined. Oftentimes, this is called the D65 white point. That's usually used because that is a standard for what the sunlight looks like as a color in the midday. And this is usually going to correspond to 6,500 degrees Kelvin, that color. So that's why it's called the D65 point. And the final part of an RGB color space is the gamma value. Sometimes it's a single value, sometimes it's a curve. But basically what this does is tells you how to encode different luminosities. This is to save space by using less information in parts of the image or signal where the human eye really can't tell the difference anyway and use more information where the human eye can determine more detail. So it's basically just to save information. Now let's get into some specific examples of RGB color spaces. You may have heard of some of these before. Now these are gonna be smaller or larger depending on how they're defined with the values and options I just described. Now the first color space is called sRGB and this one is used pretty much for all computer monitors, web content, all stuff like that. And this was actually created because it was easily reproducible on CRT monitors, cathode ray tubes. So it was widely adopted because most computer screens could display it and it was used ever since. It's actually kind of a small color space relatively. The next color space you may have heard of is Adobe RGB. This is significantly larger than sRGB and this was developed to encompass more of the colors in the CMYK color model so that when photographers went to print stuff, they would have a pretty good representation of what the final product is going to look like after it's been printed, but it can also be displayed on a computer screen and look right. There are also a lot larger color spaces like Adobe Wide Gamut RGB or Pro Photo RGB. To do something that's wide gamut, you'd probably have to buy a very special monitor that has 10-bit color. Not gonna get into all that, but you know, it's really expensive. You'd have to buy a specialized monitor for that. All right, so all that's great, but how does it relate to the computer monitor you're using right now? That's what we're gonna talk about next. Every camera, monitor, printer, anything that produces color 
is capable of producing a range of colors. This range of color for that specific device is called the device's color gamut. So when you go to buy a computer monitor, you should consider the color gamut of that monitor and how it relates more importantly to the color spaces you'll be using. This relationship is called the coverage. So you could look at some monitor and see that it has a color gamut that has 100% coverage of the sRGB color space, but then you might see that it also has only 80% coverage of Adobe RGB. It's really not that common to find a monitor that has 100% Adobe RGB unless you specifically buy a monitor for that. But you can spend a pretty good amount of money and get a 100% sRGB coverage monitor. For example, I measured my monitor's color gamut and it has a 99.7 sRGB coverage and about 77% of Adobe RGB. I didn't even know that before I bought it. That was before I knew anything. It was a mono price monitor, but I was pretty happy to find out it's got that good coverage. So in that case, because it's so close to covering all the colors in sRGB, if a image is encoded in sRGB color space, then I know that it's going to look how it's intended to. If you have a really low coverage, maybe like less than 90% or more lower than that, then even if the image looks okay, it's not going to look how it should, and you might not even notice until you go to a monitor that does have high coverage. So if you do a lot of photo editing, graphic arts, that kind of stuff, and you have a really cheap monitor, it might look right to you, but then when you export it and send it to someone with a good monitor or even a different monitor, it's going to look a lot worse, possibly. If you're in that kind of field, you really want to have 100% coverage of the space that you're using, so at least your reference image, the one you create, is going to be accurate. In most cases, you probably don't need that good coverage of Adobe RGB unless you're a photo editor, but sRGB is used in pretty much all computer applications, web content, stuff I already mentioned. So next time you go to buy a monitor, definitely try to get 100% sRGB coverage and you might be amazed by how much better stuff looks. So as a story to prove this, I actually used to edit videos on a TN panel which was meant for gaming and it really didn't have that great color coverage. So I was editing these videos thinking they looked totally fine and people were saying, you look really red in this video. Why do you look so red? And I thought, I'm like, what? This looks fine. And then when I got to my other monitor, which is an IPS panel with that 99% coverage, I looked at it and I'm like, sure enough, I looked red in the face in this video and I had no idea because my color gamut was off. I thought it looked fine, but for other people with different monitors and different coverages, I looked red. So that just illustrates how important it is to get a monitor that represents colors well. Now, the final thing I wanna talk about is calibration of monitors. You could buy a great monitor with 100% coverage, but if it's not calibrated, it still might not be representing colors accurately. So as a little bit of background, every monitor is gonna have a correct color profile, which basically is set in the operating system or the graphics card settings, which tells the display device how to output the signal to make sure that the monitor is displaying colors correctly. Now there is a color calibration tool in Windows, but if you really want to do it right, you get a colorimeter, which is a little device you stick on your monitor and you run some software and it measures and tests how a color should look like compared to how your monitor is outputting it. And then based on all that information, it generates a color profile so that you know that the monitor is outputting the colors in that space how they should look. I actually have one of these calibration devices called a Spider 5 and I use some third party software, not what comes with it. And that's how I was able to make sure that I got the correct calibration for my monitor and actually measured that it had that really high sRGB coverage. If you guys are interested in something like that, I'll put the link in the description so you can see more about it. But that is everything I wanted to talk about. Oh my gosh, this is gonna be a long video, but I hope you guys, for you who stuck through it, I hope you guys found it interesting. So if you guys wanna give it a like, that would be great. And you can talk about this in the comment section below. We can have a continued conversation. And if you guys wanna check out some other videos on the right hand side, you can either click them or look in the description for the same link, like if you're on a phone. And if you wanna subscribe, I make videos three times a week, so it should be worth it. So as usual guys, thanks for watching. I will see you next time. Have a good one.